So today we're in the great company of Ashley Simone. It's great to see you again, Ashley. She, Ashley has lectured at T-Space Residency last year as well. I'm, I'm glad to welcome you back. Um, Ashley is uh, a New York City-based editor, writer, and photographer, and educator, and her practice investigates the intersection of art, architecture, and culture. So transdisciplinary thinking uh, here um, again. Her photography explores the built environment and has been exhibited in New York and London and has been featured in very many journals and magazines. And she has founded Editrix in 2019, which is an editorial and curatorial consultancy. Before that, she has worked in architecture and construction management with Chumi and WXY Architecture and Urban Design. Um, select books um, that she has edited include books by Kenneth Crampton, Alan Wexler, Michael Webb, Jean-Louis Cohen, and others. And uh, she, while she's trained as an architect at, at Columbia University G Shop, at present she teaches courses in drawing and writing for the School of Architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. And I'm glad to share uh, your website as well in our chat bar for everyone to see further uh, details and get in touch with you. For, for the structure of this lecture, um, Ashley, you'll start with a presentation about 45 minutes and then we'll follow up with um, roughly 15 minutes questions and answers um, and a discussion uh, which is open to the public as well. So the public can join um, by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You see, and our panelists and Ashley can see the Q&A button as well. Um, so with no further ado, I would like to welcome everyone. And uh, thank you, Ashley, for being here. We're thank excited to have you. Thank you, Irini. I'm happy to be back. Um, and welcome to the, the residents. I, I'm sorry that I can't uh, be seeing you in person this year. Um, but I do look forward to seeing your work uh, during the midterm and the final. Uh, so today I'm going to begin by telling you a, a bit about my practice more broadly. And I'll illustrate this practice with brief notes on recent work and then provide a closer examination of four projects that represent a cross section of my work. So beyond describing my practice, it's my hope that this message the messaging that I present here uh, will provide insight that you can extrapolate to the residency's design challenge to create a transformation of consciousness pavilion for the Montgomery Place landscape located in New York, New York's Hudson Valley. So the media that I produce takes the forms of books, photographs, and exhibitions that reside at the intersection of art, architecture, and culture and are informed by my training in architecture. Among those I work with are artists, architects, theorists, historians, cultural institutions, and publishers. The practice integral to, um, the practices integral to my method of working are often consistent across the projects and include looking, observing, seeing, interpreting, analyzing, and describing. The fundamental task in all of the work is the same. That is to speak through the medium, whether it be written words, photographs, an exhibition, or a book, and to transpose a subject, a method, or an experience using the select medium. And this is where the terms volume and phenomenology from the title of my lecture come in. It may be useful to frame those terms with a series of questions. What are the principles and ethics behind creative work, spatial or other? How does one read those principles? How does one experience them? How does one conceive of them? And how does one reconceive or represent them? You know, these are ultimately very personal questions. And I can't really provide objective answers, but I can talk about my work and show you how I grapple with the issues. So to, to set this up, um, you know, for me, the questions recall uh, John Hayduck's essay uh, written for 
uh, the title of the essay is The Flatness of Depth. He wrote this for a book on Judith Turner's architectural photographs. In, a, in the essay, he says this, there are many kinds of architectural realities and interpretations of those realities, which include the major issue of representation or representation. Whatever the medium used, be it a pencil sketch on paper, a small scale model, the building itself, a sketch of the built building, a model of the built building, a film of the built building, or a photograph of the above realities, a process is taking place. Some sort of distortion is occurring a distortion that has to do with the interpretation and reinterpretation of space and all the mysteries the word space encompasses, including its spirit. So Haydock here distills the agency of representational media. In this case, the work of the architectural photographer, um, but generally he's implying that such media, representational media, not just photography, has the capacity to capture quote unquote spirit. Um, in other words, it has the capacity to embody value and potentially serve as metaphor for phenomenological experience, for being present in a place. As a means to illustrate this briefly at the outset, I'll use two of my photographs of the Barcelona Pavilion designed by the architect Mies van der Rohe. In capturing the shots, I sought to visually convey the ephemeral experience of being in the space, as well as its, its tectonic simplicity and material transparencies that participate in realizing Mises' desire for architecture to, to, to dissolve into almost nothing. On the left, a reflection of a structural slab ever so slightly engages the roof slab, suggesting the possibility of an impossibly weightless plane of marble poised to float away. The photograph on the right implicates material and the atmospheric condition of wind, which you see present in the water's reflection as a means to approximate the conditions of being in the space and being subject to the gentle winds amid the configuration of planes that shift by way of reflection. This idea of seeking to understand and represent value in this case, my intent to distill the value and experiences the designer Mies honed for the building is not exclusive to photographic media. I think of it as a scalar concept, achievable in the calibration of a singular photograph, the design of a building, and all that is in between. I no longer work as an architect who participates in the making of buildings. My current practice is preoccupied with representing architecture and other, and that which is located at the intersection of art, architecture, and culture. In so doing, I'm consciously working through a process of evaluation, of critical looking. You know, I'll take you back to the slide that I used earlier uh, to describe my method. Um, so the process of evaluation of critically looking um, I'm consciously operating to locate the spirit of the work, the spirit that Haydock uh, was speaking about in relation to architecture. Um, and in this, I, in it, so in the work, um, you know, the ideas that I may be observing or critiquing, reconceiving, reconceiving or repositioning are considered through this critical lens. And it holds true, <clears throat> excuse me, um, across the typologies of media in which I work. Um, so, what, uh, so what I'm gonna do now is just take you briefly through some current uh, and recent projects to give you a sense of um, the scope of the, the materials that I work on. Um, hang on. So this, uh, this first project, uh, and I should say that after this brief you know, introduction, which is a quick survey, I will go in more detail into um, four different projects, as I mentioned at the beginning. So what you're looking at here is the um, 
recently designed cover of uh, the 2020 issue of Trans Journal, which is, uh, the issue is, is called Trans Fiction, and it'll be released later this summer. Trans in this case refers to the exploration of topics across architecture and design beyond a surface understanding and through the intricacies of their implications. This is an annual publication of the College of Architecture Planning and Landscape Architecture in Arizona. In January, I began working with a group of students to develop an open call and curate and edit a volume comprising of submissions from contributors across disciplines who have provided reflections on architecture across, beyond, and through fiction that take the forms of writing, design, and artwork. In February of this year, just before the pandemic hit, the first volume of Frank Gehry's Catalogue Resonate was released in Los Angeles. Published by Kaeda uh, and designed by the New York firm Matsumoto, the 500 plus page eight pound volume for which um, Gary's sketches are the primary graphic material is the first in a planned series of seven. I worked closely with John Louise Cohen to refine the volume's text on this project. Um, Volume one begins with drawings uh, from Gary's thesis at USC and ends in 1978 with his home in Santa Monica. Uh, and the plan is to continue uh, probably for about the next decade um, methodically uh, and chronologically working through Gary's work um, and uh, using, continuing to use his sketches as the primary graphic material um, to accompany the text. This book, uh, In Search of African American Space, just recently went to the printer, I think like 10 days, 10 days ago. Um, so I worked as a co-editor on this anthology designed and published by Lars Mueller, which explores the relationship with, between the African diaspora diaspora and uh, contemporary spatial practice from multiple critical vantages in order to locate a transhistorical moment in the afterlife of slavery. Traditional notions of space are challenged as the analyses in this volume transcend discipline deriving from architecture, performance, art, history, and visual culture. And some, you know, so some other things that I might work on, um, last, last spring, I was invited to write a piece of criticism on um, Beatrice Colomina's book, X-ray Architecture, uh, which examines the relationship between uh, tuberculosis and X-ray technology in modern architecture. Um, and it's a fascinating book. Uh, the premise may sound uh, dubious at the outset, but uh, she makes an excellent, excellent argument. Um, and another, uh, another important recent project um, that I had an opportunity to work over a few years with the you know, architect and artist Alan Wexler on um, his monograph, Absurd Thinking Between Art and Design. Um, and in this way, or in, in projects like these, I feel, in most of my projects, in fact, um, I feel very lucky that I get to intersect all of these different uh, types of thinkers um, who inevitably, you know, push me to expand the way I think about things, um, and hopefully I push them, um, and, uh, and, and always, you know, have to push them on schedule and things like that, which can be rather tough. With, um, with artists in particular. Um, the, another, uh, another thing that I uh, worked on uh, not too long ago was uh, the creation of this exhibition space. It was really uh, the design of a, a space to, um, to hold uh, meetings, uh, thinking about um, topics related to private choices and public spaces. Um, in particular, uh, a design action um, that was being explored for an abortion clinic. Um, and what were, so I, I guess, you know, I, I bring this, this older project up now only because, um, you know, we're at, we're at this moment where 
there's protests and, and there's this issue of um, you know being in public space um, and safety, which uh, was the the purpose of this particular installation was to raise awareness um, and consider from a design perspective how uh, design could begin to mitigate um, the insecurities uh, in in certain uh, charged and contentious uh, public realms. Um, as Irini mentioned, you know, I sometimes will publish um, commercial photography. Don't do that very often anymore. Uh, and I prefer to um, work through uh, or my photography, um, you know, as in this project, which is a series called Impermanence, uh, which is intended to capture the spirit of a public landscape that serves as a social and commercial space between the water and a rapidly developing urban center of Lome, Togo, Africa. So that's a broad cross section. Um, and in each of these cases, uh, the, uh, the method is, is really quite the same. It's, it's that idea uh, that I brought up before um, of uh, critical representation of um, thinking through how one sees um, and paying particular attention uh, to the subject matter that you are trying to you know, understand or represent um, and what the value is within it and how it can actually begin to um, I, begin to speak to another person um, and help them you know, tap into their senses, emotions, uh, and, and, and that's an argument that, um, uh, that many people make in architecture, right? It's not just about um, uh, bringing the spirit into or identifying the spirit and reconceiving it in graphic work. Um, it's, it's also about architecture, uh, maybe even you know, more so, or it might be more widely recognized in, in that way. Um, Okay, so you know, here uh, I will go ahead and, and take you through uh, some select projects. And there's four of them that we will we'll track through. So the first one um, is titled The Skin of the Eyes. Um, and it's connected to a related project uh, called Synergy of Excess, Culturalization of Commodity or commodification of culture in the fashion houses of Tokyo. Um, so this is an older project, but one I often revisit because much of the groundwork for my current thinking and approaches lie in it. Its title, the skin of the skin of the eye, its title is the skin of the eyes, and I took the and it took the form of an exhibition of my photographs alongside a related set of drawings. Um, that were part of a larger architectural research project, as I mentioned, and that research project investigated the architectural skins of eight fashion houses in Tokyo, including Prata, Prada and Emoto Sando by Herzog and Demiron and Christian Dior in Ginza um, by the architect Kumiku Inui. So the research and the exhibition were documented in the associated self-published book, Synergy of Excess, Culturalization of Commodity in the Fashion Houses of Tokyo, um, which advanced earlier writing I had done as a graduate student on the relationship between fashion and architecture in Paris. So simultaneous with the research and photography of these glossy and well-published buildings, I was reading The Eyes of the Skin uh, by the Finnish architect and writer Wani Palazma and The Function of Ornament by architect Farshad Musavi. So Musavi celebrated ornament and the surface uh, and sur architecture of surface. Um, so she was celebrating the architecture I had been observing in Tokyo. Uh, and she was claiming that architecture, architects need not be bothered with interior spatiality because ornament and affect could allow architecture 
to connect with the populace. Palos Ma, on the other hand, was railing against the failure of architecture to engage all five senses, which he attributed in part to focused vision, uh, the negative byproduct of Renaissance techniques of perspective projection in what he called retinal architecture, architecture which is better suited to look good in a photograph as opposed to accommodating the body and nurturing the soul. Uh, so, and within that book, you know, I've pulled out uh, just one quote um, to begin to, it, let me just read the quote. Uh, architecture has become an art of the printed image. In our culture of pictures, the gaze itself flattens into a picture and loses its plasticity. Instead of experiencing our being in the world, we behold it from the outside as spectators of images projected on the surface of the retina. So while I do not agree with uh, Musabi's position that architects could ignore spatiality, um, I did appreciate the architectural surfaces in Tokyo for their beauty and also for the complexity of their envelopes. And I wanted to do something with the photographs I was making while reflecting on um, these, these two different authors that had become a big part of my, uh, my, my life at the time. Uh, and so a middle ground was found in this exhibition. Photographs of the architectural surfaces of eight buildings were selected and a drawing was constructed for each. Um, The drawings use the perspectival view of the photograph to reconstruct the camera's position. The position is then respatialized and an abstracted eye placed at the location of the observer. The photograph of the architectural surface is then projected upside down and backwards onto the quote unquote retina of the abstract eye and the entire system is then rotated, enabling the observer of the diagram to understand their vantage point as outside the system. Um, so as a means to, so at face value, the construction technique very literally appropriates what Palasma cautions against, the primacy of focused vision. I'm gonna just flip back here. Um, and which he saw as a symptom of perspectival representation techniques and, and also, um, the, the existence of image architecture or retina architecture, as he calls it. Um, so the, I, I hope that that's quite clear. Um, sometimes when I try to explain these drawings to, 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 to people, uh, they, they, they don't really get it. Um, but the ultimate point is um, that I'm trying to convey to you with uh, you know, that, that idea of starting with, um, so I start with the, the things that Palasma said were wrong. Um, and you know, in doing that, uh, it, it, it isn't a, a statement um, of whether or not I agree or disagree with Palasma. I'm actually quite aligned with his theories and philosophies and architecture, uh, but it just became a starting point to begin to uh, work through some, some creative work and a process. Um, so as a means to acknowledge his theories in the drawings, the elements comprising them, the line work in the photos were printed on both sides of three quarter inch plex, or acrylic. Um, and doing that embedded the potential for parallax within each of the drawings. Parallax is the phenomenon of motion which takes place when a stationary offset object uh, appears to move in relation to another. And 
the effect requires a moving observer uh, to become activated. And so I made a little video um, that begins to show how uh, that, um, that affect works in the drawings. So you see that the image in the back appears to float you know, within that abstracted eyeball. So an observer subtly shifting their position in relation to the drawing will activate the effect. In conjunction with the shadows that are inevitably projected on the mounting surface, um, the activated parallax subverts focused uh, vision and engages peripheral vision. The production method of the drawings responded to a statement by Pallas Ma that unconscious peripheral perception transforms retinal gestalt into spatial and bodily experiences. Um, so like I mentioned before, you know, the, the creative work began, you know, just with a literal translation of um, uh, ideas that Palazma was, was railing against. Um, but then through the production method of, um, you know, printing the material on this three quarter inch plex, um, thinking about affect, which was actually a reflection um, on, um, on this particular architectural skin, uh, the, the Dior uh, Ginza store, um, where it has, uh, its facade is made of two planes uh, with that, and there's perforations. And um, you can, when you're walking by, feel almost like something is moving. Um, okay, so second project. Um, second project is a monograph titled Two Journeys, which was released by Lars Mueller's publishers in 2018 after about five years of work with the architect trained artist Michael Webb. The architectural theorist, um, Mark Wigley, who contributed an essay for the book, characterized the act of confining Webb to the condition of permanence implied by a book as tantamount to an act of violence. And so beyond the curation of the content and the editing of the book, there became a secondary issue to grapple with, you know, how to defy permanence and stasis. Um, and this, uh, you know, it became actually an, an opportunity where uh, I began to explore those, um, the ideas that I was talking about at the beginning, or how do you really read something, be it a piece of architecture, be it a body of work by an artist, um, to understand their motivations and uh, begin to translate the, those motivations uh, through a different type of media. Um, and so when reflecting on this process of, of making this book, um, I like this, this quote um, on, on the right, which it's, uh, I can't, it's somehow blocked from my vision, um, but it, it, it refers to... Um, you want me to read it? Yes, please. The book is a medium of expression that creatively engages with content as both object and concept. Okay. Um, so in spe like being specific about the book itself, um, that, uh, that quote gets to the, the same idea about uh, reading value um, and representing value uh, through different lenses. So the the title of the introduction to Two Journeys is the notion of motion, which simultaneously refers to Michael Webb's desire for perpetual change and embodies the foundations on which his work is conceived. Webb primarily works through 2D drawings using orthographic and perspectival uh, drawing systems of architecture. Some of the drawings represent uh, agents of the built environment, 
while others, often those uh, rendered in oil paint, which I'll show you momentarily, uh, conjure fantastical environments. Uh, the common ground for the work is found in the depiction of time conveyed through the capture of motion. So developing and editing uh, two journeys with Michael Webb you know, went beyond a curatorial and editorial pursuit and became about finding a way to communicate notions of permanence and of motion within the confines of the book. And you can um, see here that one of the, one of the techniques um, was to have the, the footnotes uh, operate in a, in a different way. Um, let's see. So, okay. So I can't point to it, but I, I'm sure you can see it. Um, the, so when, when we began the editing process for, um, uh, for the book, and we're going back and forth with texts. I would I would always send Michael these documents, um, littered with little notes uh, in in bubbles on the side, and and somehow, you know, he oh thank you, Irene. Um, you know he uh, really enjoyed uh, getting those. Maybe not so much the content in the bubbles, um, but it made him feel that uh, that the the work was still a living document. It was still in you know, in motion, in progress. And, um, and so we decided to uh, put this, uh, put this uh, convention within the book itself. And so Michael offers uh, these side commentaries. Um, if any of you have, uh, and I, I think at least a couple of you, or maybe certain people in the audience um, have listened to Michael speak, um, you know how he uh, can, likes to, to bring up a, you know, a reference that might be seemingly random, but uh, he eventually brings it right back to the point. Um, so that was one way in which we were able to kind of thwart the, the stasis of, um, uh, of a book itself. Um, and another way was by you know, looking closer into um, how the work operates. So like I mentioned before, you know, Michael is interested in um, uh, architectural drawing systems as a means to describe the, uh, his observations of the environment. And a lot of his early work had to do with observations on cars and speed um, and beginning to try to develop techniques to convey speed and time in two dimensions. Um, so you can see on the right where there's this drawing uh, that represents a car backing out of a parking space. And you know, in, in Michael's mind, uh, this car is backing out and, and getting ready to proceed on, on a long journey. Um, and so what we did was to think through like what we could do with that um, in, in the book. And so we worked with some students at Pratt and made uh, an, an animation um, of that sequence of the car backing out and then extrapolated it to you know, the beginning of a journey where you can see like a change in speed um, that takes place when the you know, figurative car you know, passes another car to continue on, on the journey. Um, and then we extracted stills from that um, to deploy them across the chapter uh, that deals with his um, preoccupation and his artwork um, that engages uh, the car and different types of moving vehicles um, and the idea of motion. And so you can see that the, um, the frames of the animation uh, are are presented across the top of this, this chapter, and they begin to intersect, um, as you see on the right with the red drawing, uh, the other graphic material presented in the book. And this was something uh, very important because uh, you know, Michael uh, was, had been a member of um, Archigram, and uh, he was used to 
having these uh, very chaotic drawings. I mean, his, his later work is, is certainly cannot be described as, as chaotic. It's quite serene and beautiful. And you'll see some of that soon. Um, but he did want to you know, echo uh, those origins. And so developing this frieze to run across the top of the book and intersect certain pieces um, allowed him to feel happy um, and he also uh, caused our, our Swiss publisher not to have a heart attack um, over something that might take on a certain aesthetic like, like this. Um, so this, this happened again in, uh, in, in the second part of the book, uh, which explores his um, observations and his artwork on a project called Temple Island, which is actually based on a real landscape um, in Regatta in, in England um, that he has quite obsessively documented um, and developed narratives for over the course of his career. And so here you begin to see uh, what I mentioned before, the fantastical environments uh, where he's actually doing drawings and then rendering them uh, in, in oil paint. Um, and you'll see in the middle there something you know, called the submersible, which really just speaks to the fantastical and narrative quality. Um, the submersible ends up being uh, in, in a submarines type vehicle that explores you know, the waters of this landscape that Michael is documenting. Um, so the, you'll see again another, um, another graphic that seems to be projecting through the chapter. And it actually, uh, the projection originates from um, a drawing and a painting at the, on the last page of the chapter. Um, and I won't go too much into detail with uh, what the painting is, but it's basically looking at um, orthographic projection and perspective projection of the same landscape and thinking through um, the, the existence of infinity that's typically implied within perspective projection, which would be the one um, at the, the, the red uh, portion of the drawing at the top. Uh, and so, you know, riffing on that concept of infinity, um, because the confines of the space really mean nothing on the, on the picture plane uh, depicting infinity, uh, Michael thought it wouldn't matter if the painting ended where it actually ended, where you can sort of see that faint line, um, or if it was stretched to the beginning, because either way, beginning of the chapter, either way, it uh, was representing uh, infinity. And so it projects through, backward through the chapter to vanish um, on the first page. And so the last thing I'll talk about in, in this particular project was another design challenge. Um, you see on the right, uh, it looks like kind of the same painting you know, evolving over time. Um, and in, in fact, that is a tendency uh, that Michael Webb has. Uh, in, in the series presented there on the right, um, the one on the top left, which still has a bit of the, the drawing pencil elements, uh, left in it is actually dated 1977 and the one on the bottom right uh, 2018 um, so the 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 idea of the multiple uh, became very important and it, it was actually something that we we struggled in uh, on because I I really liked the multiples Michael who um, has is never quite satisfied with his work uh, wanted to erase a lot of a lot of the past and not bring it up, but we we came to an agreement, um, and we did uh, put multiples within the book. You might have seen some of them um, in the the scroll through the chapter that I just showed you, um, 
and here, you know, as a means to describe uh, the work uh, after the fact, as Michael was preparing to give a lecture about the book, we developed this animation that begins to show um, the evolution of the work. Okay, so I have uh, two more projects, and I think time is time is looking okay. Um, so the third project um, is an essay. Um, the essay is uh, titled you know, Value in the Metaphor of Phenomenology, um, which might sound familiar, uh, in the Visual Schemes of Kenneth Frampton. Uh, and I wrote this essay you know, at the invitation of Robert Ricardo and Carla Britton uh, to contribute to the anthology Modern Architecture and the Life World, Essays in Honor of Kenneth Frampton which will be released in the fall uh, by Thames and Hudson. So the essay explores, um, and you know, I, I might take for granted uh, that, that, that some of you may not know who Kenneth Fenton is. Um, it, that may especially be true if you're, if you're not in the architecture. Uh, so Fenton is a, um, he is a trained architect. Um, he is nearly 90 years old. Uh, he stopped practicing architect, architecture as a young man uh, and became a, a writer and a theorist uh, of architecture. Um, he's quite highly respected uh, with, uh, across the world, really. Um, so the, the essay uh, explores Frampton's attitudes towards the representation of architecture in printed media. And more specifically, it examines his published discourse across six decades to illuminate his theory and practice of calibrating media, media to produce meaning, approximate experience, and generate value. Whether that value is material, structural, social, political, or phenomenological. And there is, in fact, a resonance between the humanistic ideals Frampton envisions for the built for built form and the operative qualities of the graphics that accompany his published discourse uh, which succeed in approximating tactile and phenomenological experiences so that same topic that i've been talking about um, since the beginning and that i showed you um, in the barcelona pavilion uh, i i see you know, frampton doing this. Um, and so my, and obviously you know, I have been um, colored by uh, my, my associations you know, with him um, and the work I've done with him. So the essay is actually informed um, by a 2015 book. I think it actually didn't come out till 16. Um, but called A Genealogy of Modern Architecture, Comparative Critical Analysis of Built Form. Um, so in the you know, research, curation, and editing of this book, A Genealogy of Modern Architecture, um, I began to, to, have, to become aware of um, the things that I'm talking about, the, the methods of operation and that search for value um, that I'm talking to you about today. So the book was produced over a decade, um, one during which I went from being a graduate student in architecture at Columbia to starting and finishing a six year career managing construction projects and, and beginning the cultural practice I'm speaking uh, about to you today. Uh, so the other informing experience for this essay is research that I'm currently pursuing in anticipation of mounting an exhibition titled Visual Rhetoric, which is now being considered for a 2022 um, slot at the Center for Architecture, although COVID has um, begun to affect plans even that far out. And I'm not sure yet what will come of this. Um, but the research itself you know, explores the editorial work of Frampton between 1962 and 65, when he was the technical editor of Architectural Design Magazine. Um, 
And you know, the essay begins, okay, so because I'm running short on time, let me, um, I'll try to make this a little bit more brief. Um, so as with a lot of things that I do, um, the essay begins rather obliquely uh, with a reference to a 16th century painting, um, St. Joseph in the Carpenter Shop uh, by the French painter uh, Latour. Um, and at face value, you know, it might seem like an odd starting point for a piece about a theorist of modern architecture, um, but it, uh, you know, it, it came from a, a book, uh, a, the idea came to me uh, through the critical reading of this book uh, by John Berger. And you know, in the book, Berger begins to, uh, well, he, he talks about Latour as a painter and his early career and his late career. Um, this particular painting is from his later career. And he's, Berger is tracing out uh, the, the difference between you know, the early work and the later work. And in this later work, you see um, like the material transparency uh, given to the hand of the boy there who is supposed to represent Jesus. Um, and, and you can also begin to kind of look at the condition of the carpenter's skin, of, of the wood block um, underneath him, and of the condition of the lighting. And uh, you know, Berger was pointing to the fact that um, the, what, what's going on in the painting um, is really a register of, the, of being, in a, being in a space um, and a register of a shift in the thinking of Latour, whose early paintings are very much from, from the outside. Um, he relates them to still lifes. And so the, you know, the reason for beginning my essay um, in this way was to kind of set the stage for that difference of um, representation. And you know, there, there is that representation from you know, outside the system uh, that might be a still life, that might be more sterile. And sometimes there's um, time, uh, uh, the right moment for that. Uh, but you know, other times uh, you, might, you might look deeper, you might search for that value and, and search for ways to translate um, the experience of space. And that's what I had seen you know, Frampton doing um, in these projects that I had been working on with him. Uh, and it, it took place you know, both in the um, individual images I saw him selecting uh, and also you know, in working on a genealogy of modern architecture, which really investigates um, locating value um, and reading value in, in built work. Uh, the, the, the process of doing the layouts of the book um, and making associations uh, between architecture and art uh, was taking place. Um, and so my essay talks around those topics. And uh, you know, so things that, that, that I discuss in the essay you know, include you know, having looked back to um, a very early publication um, Modern Architecture in the Critical Present, which preceded um, his rather famous book, um, Modern Architecture, Critical History, um, and, and then investigating you know, the, the image that Frampton selected. Um, and I talk about those investigations within the essay. And so this, um, this in particular uh, is by an artist named Ben Johnson. Um, and and it took me a while to kind of think through what was going on here um, and why Frampton might select it. Uh, but this is um, a Norman Foster building uh, in London. Um, and the, you know, what's captured, the, you know, the undulations captured in that you know, very flat facade um, begin to, at least in my mind, uh, talk about the the environment around. So, you know, that would be the building reflecting the water reflecting that which is in the water. Um, so the undulations capture atmosphere, despite the rather reductive um, 
nature of the representation itself. So, let's see, because I want to show you one last project that won't take too long, I will speed through some of this. Um, but you know, again, I in in this essay I go back and look at some of the early uh, work that Frampton was doing um, in terms of graphics. You know, he was designing, he designed these covers for architectural design, um, as well as edited the um, the magazine, and you know, he actually designed it and was the construction manager of this building on the right. Um, and so he's making a choice of you know, how to, what does he put on the cover of this magazine that's going to talk about this quite beautiful building that he did. Um, and he puts a detail on there because the detail really begins to define how um, space modulates the body within the confines of the apartments that are in this building. Um, and you know, ultimately it's a nod to his humanistic understanding of architecture um, and the importance of uh, accommodating the body, um, which if you remember back to Palazma is, is something that he was um, advocating as well. So the last project um, is, a, uh, is a photography project that I have been working on for a while. Um, it began as a photographic essay um, and has expanded into a research project concerned with investigating the social and political factors in Cuba that led to the post-revolution transformation of Tarara, which is a small community in Havana de Las, located 19 miles east of central Havana. Uh, the project aims to reconstruct the architectural genealogy of Tarara and has developed from interviews and site visits that have uncovered details regarding the history and transformation of the contemporary condition of the residential enclave, which was built during the 1940s and 50s for upper middle class Cubans and later appropriated by the regime of Fidel Castro before falling into disrepair. So the photographs register, register uh, the confluence of disparate architectural typologies you know, and the passage of time in a series that convey the present day um, eerie and surrealistic qualities of the community. Uh, the images reveal a 30 foot tree sprouted from the roof of a former residence. Once a family home, the structure that forms the base of the tree now sits adjacent to the abandoned theater that you're looking at now, conceived in the tectonic language of Russian constructivism um, and decorated on the interior with graffiti. Appearing down the road from um, an international style duplex is a mannered Spanish colonial residence, empty but for four feet of dead leaves that occupy its garage. So there's the tree that sprouted from the roof. Um, there's the international duplex, international style duplex. Um, the mannered Spanish colonial and the leaves. Um, and other kind of uh, dystopic scenes from, um, from this community, which I, I find very fascinating. Um, you can even see, this is a former hospital. Um, there abandoned is a, a vehicle overtaken by, by Ivy that was actually an emergency vehicle. Um, and this, this residential area is only about one, um, one square mile. Um, in any case, the, you know, what I'm doing there, um, I'm still kind of working out. You know, I've been collecting these photographs um, and uh, planning to try to write something um, as I learn more about uh, what exactly caused the scene that, um, that I find so fascinating um, in, in Cuba. And that's it. 
thank you very much, Ashley. This has been very rich um, and really beautiful, very deep, um, uh, and and quite complex. Really, how you transfer from one medium to the other, from photography to writing to drawing to book. Um, so it's a very dynamic um, flow <laughs> uh, that this this range of your of your work represents. Um, I would love to uh, open up uh, to discussion and questions from the audience and from the residents, of course. Um, so you can um, feel free to use the Q and A. Um, you should see that at the bottom of your screen, and um, we can um, we can take your questions from there. So. To our, to our residents, feel free to unmute and, uh, and let's start. So, Irini, I, for some reason, I, I no longer have control and I cannot stop the sharing. Um, I wonder if I think I... That's, that's okay. We can, it's, I think it's fine to, to leave it. Do you, do you mind or should, do you want to stop the sharing? Um, no, that's fine. Um, People can see your website as well. I think that's helpful. Okay. Ashley, I would actually love maybe if we were to go back to uh, to this diagram that you had about critical looking and evaluation. I would love to maybe um, discuss this a little bit more if you can walk us through it because I think it is it is quite important to. Um, for uh, for our residents and the general audience also to um, to to see how maybe you're approaching this or um, the evaluation and the and the critical looking part I think is very critical today um, so it would be maybe helpful to to revisit that yeah let me if I can okay it's it's making its way back as you get a quick preview of everything. Um, <laughs> there we go. Um, okay, so wait, did you ask a question that I need to respond to? If you can walk us through it maybe, and, and let's, I, would, I would love to take a little bit more time with this because I, I think it's very, very important. Okay, um, so, you know, I actually, I, I found this diagram um, due to a, you know, a video that I that I that was created by the Toledo Museum of Art that begins to talk about the um, the idea of visual literacy and I, I teach a course um, titled Visual Literacy uh, not at Pratt I teach it online for the University of Arizona and and I. I do hope that some of my students from there tuned in. Um, but the, you know, so this, this idea of visual literacy uh, was, was very, it was interesting to me because it, it felt to me when I, when I watched this video that it's, it's always something that I've sort of thought about or the way that I've operated or exist in the world. Um, you know, sometimes I find that when I'm walking around Manhattan, um, I have to look down because I, if I need some, I, I often cannot get any peace because my, my eyes are, are looking at, at so much. Um, and sometimes I just need a little bit of peace. And so I have to walk with my head down. And so when I saw this video and began to develop this course on visual literacy, um, it, it was interesting to me to, you know, learn that that people not everyone was was like me and that that might sound very ridiculous to say of course they're not but i think one has a tendency to assume um that uh certain things that you're you're tuned into are maybe more common than than not um and in that uh, so in the video it uh, it begins to talk about like the principles behind seen critically in art and, and graphics. Um, and it very much registered with things that I had learned in, in architecture school. Uh, and, 
and then I began to you know, just think about it in relation to everything else that I'm doing, where, you know, as I was talking about with, um, I think across most of the projects, you know, in working with um, Michael Webb, you know, really trying to, you know, learn and understand his process to look at it, to observe it, to see it, um, and, and then reflect on it on the other side. Uh, because I think it's it's often habit to just um, you know passively look, and you know, then as you know, in terms of um, you know taking that into consideration, uh, you know I begin to you know make connections to certain things that um, that I've read. You know, so the reading of of Palas Ma. Um, where I begin to kind of register you know, his thoughts and ideas on, on looking and seeing and um, translating those ideas. I, like, I enjoy making those connections. So um, I, I think I'm kind of talking maybe too much around this topic, but um, you know, this process is something that I think can happen you know, with one work in particular, um, with one artist in particular, uh, or one author, but it also happens kind of across uh, the spectrum so that you, you know, as, at least for me, I begin to draw these connections, which you know, might be why you know, I end up um, you know, beginning obliquely, like I said, with um, the 16th century painting of Joseph in the carpentry shop to, to talk about uh, a condition that I observe in this modernist architectural theorist. Um, you know, I should say that Frampton's father was a carpenter. Um, so there was sort of a slight personal nod uh, in acknowledgement um, of that in the selection. Uh, and I even found it interesting, you know, in terms of reading across things, when I was looking this morning over the, um, the tour book, uh, there was a phrase in here um, where, Le, I, I'm not over the Torah, over the Burger book, there's a phrase that, you know, directly applies to how Palazma is talking about space, you know, Palazma talks about how dynamic space is one that, you know, nurtures the consciousness, um, you know, encouraged, encourages dream and creativity, and, and that's nearly the exact same thing that uh, Berger is beginning to recognize in, in the work of this painter. Um, and so the world, the world become, seems to become smaller at that point where um, the, the thoughts and ideas are maybe simpler um, that you know, conceiving of space, which the students are doing now, especially space to nurture consciousness, um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Like you could, you could locate an idea in a simple painting, um, and it's really just about uh, what you do with this little triangle here. Um, how, you know, how big or small is it for you? Yes. Thank you. Um, I can take some questions uh, from the audience, um, or. If any of uh, you want to unmute and uh, lead this discussion, feel free to do that. Um, Ashley, you may be able to see those questions as well, but I can read them. Um, so Mewish um, is asking, and I, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing the name correctly. He says, hi, great presentation. Thanks a bunch. My question is whether Heidegger and his work has influenced your practice, especially his ideas on being in time. That's one part. The second, also if Ponty, Merlon Ponty, ideas on cognition and perception have influenced your own practice. And the third part, if you can elaborate on the use of various mediums and spatial representation switches from one to another. Thanks, from Pakistan. Oh, Pakistan. Wow. <laughs> um, well, uh, good, very, very good references. Um, I, I mean, it's, you know, I don't, I, I have an awareness of, of Heidegger um, and Merleau-Ponty, uh, you know, it was the, 
reading their philosophies and theories were, were part of my education at, at Columbia. And, um, you know, even in kind of revisiting some texts this week from, you know, by Frampton or by Palisma, uh, those names come up, they're always quoted. Um, and so, you know, I will, you know, admit to you, you know, never having poured over um, either of those writers, but having um, you know, dabbled in it, uh, and and also maybe more so, kind of looking at the impact that they have had on the thinkers um, that are a generation or more or two ahead of me. Uh, that I might be reading more closely, like Frampton or Palisma, because um, those two, you begin to digest um, the earlier theories and reflect on them. Uh, and then, you know, I see myself then reflecting on um, the work of my more contemporary teachers. And so then the, the latter part of the question was about the different media, um, maybe working between it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, yeah, that's something that's, it's a, uh, I don't really know how it happened to me. It just happened to me uh, in terms of, you know, being someone that, you know, works within uh, or works with words and thinks about space. Um, and, you know, I had uh, I have the, I have an undergraduate degree in in economics, um, and you know, I had sort of grown up always wanting to be a lawyer, and and lawyers tend to be people who you know, dabble uh, in in lots of different ideas, and um, and, and I think that uh, some something something happened along the way where I I, I kept that spirit of of wanting to be someone who you know, had the ability to engage with different types of thinkers, and so I just kept building um, different different skills, right? And you know, I I find that you know if I look at what I've ended up doing in terms of my teaching practice within the context of an architecture school, um, you know, I'm in two departments. I'm in the humanities department. I'm in the architecture department. Um, I only teach in the architecture department, but I teach drawing and writing. So there are two different, two different mediums that are doing the same thing. They're describing, you know, something, be it, you know, in the case of, of architecture. architecture. Um, so I, I guess it's, uh, to me, everything feels the same. And maybe that's why I think this triangle applies to most of my work. But I love the opportunity. Um, to, to shift. And I find that, you know, people often will tell students about, you know, how you, you know, especially in architecture and architectural drawing teachers, they tell them, well, you have to work, you have to design through the plan you know, and through the section. There's feedback that's going on. And, and I think that's a good way to describe it. Like there's feedback that happens between my writing work. Um, the writing work causes me to uh, read, to digest, to represent, um, that changes how I might think about the architecture that I'm looking at or photographing. And so there might be a change that happens there at how I'm looking at it or what I'm trying to capture. Um, and in all of it, um, the, you know, the world in terms of architecture and cultural practice just seems to be expanding you know, through that, that feedback, uh, maybe more so than if I just were staying um, in one lane. Um, but I, I like switching lanes. Sometimes it gets tiring, um, but uh, usually I can push through it. In fact, the, I think with your answer also responds directly to uh, the second question um, by Nicholas Rapp. He's thanking you for the great talk. And um, he's also asking if you'd be able to speak briefly on how you transition into such a multifaceted practice for a more traditional architectural path. Uh, so I think you're, you're really answering uh, both questions. Um, and 
it is it's complex to describe or analyze, I guess, but you're, you want to um, be um, open and listening. And, and um, it's actually goes back to this observing and interpreting, um, which really applies to all those different fields and yeah. trying to find connections between those. And, and I, you know, I like that question. I like when I get asked that question because, you know, I sometimes I reference the um, the Woody Allen movie uh, Match Point, and um, it the the whole narrative is surrounding this idea that that life is just half chance, and I firmly believe that. Um, and yeah, you know, but within that within the, the uncertainty of chance and where things are going to fall, um, you know, the person matters a lot. And, and I guess, you know, I've always been someone who um, w had a very broad set of interests. And um, somehow, you know, had, didn't really, or it wasn't really sort of shy in terms of showing up for something new or um, testing something out. And uh, I think that that, that openness, and, and sometimes, you know, I, I will find that there, there are things that I discover that I might have avoided for years. But I think the willingness to be experimental, to fail, um, and to just kind of take Take every opportunity you can get. See how it makes you feel. Pay attention to what you like. Um, you know, it, it might have been difficult to sort of suss out of that presentation um, because some of my comments were very subtle. But it, when I look back, there's a very clear line of um, through the through the projects that I that I went through at the end, um, where every like the the fashion fashion in Tokyo project. Uh, began in Paris, um, where and that, and that began with you know just a personal interest in fashion, and then studying architecture, and wanting to understand more about my personal interest you know through the lens that I was studying, and um, then you know translating that and testing it in a different context uh, of Tokyo, and then bringing in ideas about drawing. Um, which were interesting to me. So, yeah, I think it's really just about staying open and recognizing that everything is half chance. I think a lot of the work I've done um, is probably because of uh, taking advantage of opportunities uh, where I went to school. Um, and, Can we take um, maybe two or three more questions? I know we're running behind schedule here. Um, Luis, uh, Jose Luis uh, Chacon is asking uh, for a clarification um, about um, the connection of the last work in Cuba with the rest of the projects that you showed. Uh, and if you can explain the relationship with the inverted triangle diagram. So um, I guess, I think, let's go maybe one more time through it. Are these parallel, like looking at interpreting, observing and analyzing, seeing and describing and you're narrowing down? It's probably best to hear from you directly. I don't think that they're, um, I don't think they hold their, their relationships there. I think they, they all kind of mix. There's, you know, on the one side, it is mostly about observation um, and the other side is about analysis. Um, so, you know, the project in Cuba, um, you know, maybe if, if I can, I'll, I'll try to just use the, the terms here to describe how it relates. Um, you know, again, you know, my arrival in Cuba um, was because of a separate personal interest. Um, and I, you know, I went to Cuba before it was open to Americans. Um, I actually you know, landed there uh, the day that Castro died. Um, 
and I had taken this like epic journey through Panama um, and I went to uh, do yoga at the beach um, because yoga is a very important part of my life and and I had wanted to go to Cuba so I found a way to do yoga in Cuba I went to Cuba it turned out that the um, the, the yoga retreat was in Tarara, which is where my project is located now. Um, and I had intentionally not brought my camera because um, of what I had mentioned before, that, that, that sometimes I, I, I get too distracted visually um, and I was there for a different reason. Uh, but then, you know, I discovered this, this very unusual place that, that I didn't really understand. Um, you know, I didn't know that I knew, of course, about the Cuban Revolution and everything that had gone on, but it was hard for me to imagine why um, why a place looked looked like this. Uh, and so I was looking at it, right? I went initially, I just looked. And then I got there and I was trying not to be too observant because I wanted to um, you know, work on yoga, but I inevitably ended up observing um, and then beginning to, to see things a bit closer, to hear a few little things. But you know, that sort of set off um, an interest to begin to interpret what I was seeing, to talk to people, analyze what was going on, to begin to understand the social and political context that gave rise to it. Um, and now I'm at this stage where I'm trying to describe it and communicate um, being in the place you know, as well as, you know, why the place exists the way it does. And, and so to me, it does, uh, it does very much relate to the body of work. Um, and it's been a very fun investigative project because Cuba isn't actually the easiest place to get people to tell you exactly what's going on. Um, and, you know, the number of times that I've been thrown out of <laughs> that community because of walking around with my camera um, are, are numerous. I, I don't know if I can actually get back at this point. Um, but yeah, so I, I guess you know, as I look around the triangle, um, maybe it's just about you know, different resolutions of, of observing um, and different resolutions of understanding. So you have to start with the look um, begin to interpret and, and then begin to kind of investigate, analyze, and figure out what's going on. Um, so in my last trip to Cuba, I, I was able to talk to both the state architects and a private architect. Um, private architects are, are not really, uh, I don't want to say what they're, they're, they're seen as liabilities. They're, they're called free radicals in, in Cuba or in, in Havana. Um, and you know, just getting to that point took like three years. So that's, um, yeah, the, the triangle isn't, isn't parallel. And I think it's really about different resolutions of, um, of understanding something. You might start, uh, at different points at different times based on what, what it is you're looking at. Mm -hmm. that, that helps a lot. Um, the questions keep coming in. If you're okay, we can, we can take a few more. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. Munher, Munger, if you'd like to say uh, something also, feel free to unmute. Sometimes I, I, I'm looking at you leaning forward and I think you're, you're about to say something I don't want to uh, cut you off in any way. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Um, I mean, I think uh, for me, I, I was looking through the Michael Webb uh, book a couple of months ago, and what was interesting is um, how the the way you read a book was kind of reinvented for me in that book. It's like I kept kind of transferring through pages, trying to see the continuation of those drawings. And in a way, it kind of relates to what we're doing right now for a project in terms of the transformation of consciousness, kind of go going back in time and going forward. Um, and it kind of, in my opinion, it kind of relates to how you are taking your practice of kind of observing different things, uh, maybe simultaneously or at discrete moments of time. Um, 
how how would that idea translate into um, architecture or exhibition design, in your opinion? Um, okay, that, that's a good question. There's uh, there there is an article about about this topic um, called called exhibitionism. There's actually a whole log issue. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with log, um, but it's a periodical that uh, um, usually is takes on a variety of different topics in architecture and. I think it was number 19 um, that was about exhibitions themselves. Uh, so, you know, when maybe if I start with, so translating it to, you know, architecture, um, you know, maybe if I can use the, um, the example of the, the translation or the spatialization of the diagrams for uh, the Tokyo project. Um, so it, um, you know, it's a very simple move, right? Where a flat drawing is you know, transferred, is you know, pulled apart by you know, whatever logic of hierarchy um, and transferred to, uh, to two sides or either either one of a side of a, of a piece of acrylic, right? And it generates this motion in between, if you remember from, from the video. Um, so that, uh, you know, that's a, a technique um, that, uh, let's see, okay, something happened. Um, am I still there? Yes. Um Ashley, sorry, I stopped the sharing so because we have moved on to a different topic and I thought it's probably best to be able to see you larger on the screen. Okay, um, so the, the spatialization of the drawn material causes an affect and, and in that way, you know, it can begin to kind of generate a spatial curiosity. Um, and so, I guess that's one way to to talk about a translation. And, and so how do like so how do you translate that to space? Well, for me that that happens all the time in space. And I, I remember, um, I particularly like the moment where there's a couple moments in New York where I see that condition of parallax happen, um, and. I think I wrote about it in the, uh, the foreword that I did in the web book, if you want to go back and read that. Um, but it often happens with like moving trains, but it can happen in space too, like in the, in the Palais Royale in Paris, um, you have you know, these colonnades that are, when you're moving past them, they feel like they're moving between one another. Um, and so that creates kind of a, a, a dynamic environment. And, and so it's just a scalar difference between what's going on at the Palais Royale, you know, what's going on like in the subways in New York, which I wrote about in the web book, and, um, and, and what might be going on in that picture, which is actually, there's one like hanging behind me. Uh, so I would just encourage you to kind of, like how do you translate it? You break down the elements. Um, and you uh, represent it. So there's like, I'll often see a show um, or there, there's this artist that I like in terms of translating to exhibition um, who, her name is Taryn Simon. And I, I think that Kaya Dao is, is about ready to uh, issue or make issue a, a book or a monograph of her work and um, you, she, she does a very good job of kind of translating her photography work to the, the exhibition realm, where much of her work is, is about, you know, cataloging. Um, the photos can be very reductive, uh, but she then, you know, treats it almost, she treats the photographs themselves um, 
as almost, I could say she treats them as pixels, right? And so they go up in the gallery, these catalogs go up in the gallery and there is like a certain gestalt um, of the experience that you, you, don't, you don't immediately see the content, you see the structure um, that, that's holding it. And, and so that might be one way that I could talk about or give an example of, of how you might translate content to, um, to an exhibition. And I, I can also send you this exhibitionism article um, that really clearly talks about, about the idea. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Monsieur. Christopher um, Pitichami uh, is asking, um, thank you for the presentation. Would you be able to share a little more uh, about the highlights of your recent publication regarding influences analyzed relating to slavery in Africa? Again, thanks. Um, okay, so influences on, on that particular book. So um, I guess it's important to, uh, to establish you know, my, you know, my, my role on the book. Um, so I, you know, I did not initiate the publication. I was approached by um, someone who had held a conference on the topic and um, wanted to create a, a, an anthology um, utilizing some of the authors from the, the conference and, and some others that had been identified in New York. Um, so on that project, projects like that, I will work with the team of writers and, and artists in this case um, to help them clarify their ideas. And I will interface between um, the, the other editors who held the conference and identified certain uh, participants uh, and the publisher so that uh, there's someone who has an understanding of how each author is working, what it is they want to show, um, and someone kind of as an overall curator to begin to think of how the material gets uh, packaged together. So you know, my role, while I was involved in identifying um, the forward writer, Tina Camp, who is a, um, a very important writer, uh, a professor at Brown, I, on these topics um, of uh, you, the redress of racism, which is the the the, uh, by, uh, the, the secondary title of the book. Um, my role is really about clarifying and delivering the ideas um, and not identifying these ideas. So when I mentioned earlier about how I, I like to intersect intersect different modes of thoughts um, and different individuals, this is part of it. Um, I, I never would have uh, thought I would be you know, looking at a topic, looking at this particular topic so closely, um, especially at this very moment. But then to you know, be able to have the opportunity to work with these writers and artists and to learn about their reflections on, on slavery and their artistic practices that are um, basically acts of redressing you know, the racism that they have felt, that their family members have felt or, or even experienced uh, has, been, has been fascinating. And, and so that, that goes back to what I said before too. I feel very lucky um, that I, I get to intersect with such a wide cross-section of people um, and, and learn more about these topics. Um, one question about, um, one question here from uh, Utkarsha, and then one uh, that goes back a little bit to the project in Cuba. So, uh, hello, Ashley, uh, I'm Utkarsha. 
Thank you for such a great lecture. I find myself taking notes all along. I recently completed master's in art journalism. I'm also an architect and it took me a while to understand my inclinations toward architecture journalism. Can you quickly talk about photojournalism, photojournalism in architecture? Okay. Um, photojournalism in architecture. I, you know, that I can probably direct you to someone who, who could provide a, a, a better answer. And, and Irini, um, you, you know Stephen Zacks. Um, in fact, but, Stephen Zacks is um, attending. I can see, uh, Stephen, if you'd like to respond or talk, uh, let me know and I can um, see how I can accommodate this from the panel. And the reason why I want to I want to punt it off to Stephen is you know, because Stephen you know, he he does work as an he works as an architectural journalist, um, but in, in my experience with with architecture, you know the 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 photographer is is often separate from um, the person writing about the work, and. The you know the project I'm doing in Cuba, where I'm your know, writer and photographer, or even the Tokyo one, you know, those are things I conceived of myself. Um, so, in terms of photojournalism, I guess, and, and maybe I'm misinterpreting the question. If if you're looking to be someone who is out documenting um, what's going on and and happenings in in the architectural world, um, then the you know that that that's going to be a tough thing to do because the people who are getting paid to make the photos um, are trained architectural photographers. So I, I I don't know. I think I need Stephen to jump in. Maybe he's just pretend, he's just pretending to listen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he maybe is trying to figure out how to respond. There is very limited ways to interact um, from the audience. It's either through the chat or through the q and A. I'm going to call him. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering um, if um, and there is maybe there is questions. Uh, here he says, "I'm happy to respond." Um, let me see if I can actually uh, allow. Um, I'll promote him to a panelist. Yes. Hi, Stephen. I think he has to unmute. Yeah. Let's give him a moment. Okay. Okay, I'm here. Uh, I'll have to adjust my video settings but um but if you want me to uh oof, i think i'm i'm backgrounded in calicoon at the moment or something like that um we cannot see the video but we can hear you very clearly um well while i adjust it i'll just say um that there's two two different ways that I would respond. Um, one one would be um, with respect to working for magazines, which has a whole <clears throat> has a whole um, um, process that essentially you would not, as a journalist, have any role in. Uh, taking photographs they're all done by professional photographers and um and it's ends up being a big distraction from your um your role as a reporter you just you just end up not um having the ability to do both at the same time um but um yeah you know, i think I, you know, I, I, I know of um there, there's a photographer, Adam Friedberg, um, and I actually, I did want to show a project of his today, but he, he maybe is, is someone who's operating in this way as a 
architectural journalist because he gets called just like you do Stephen. Stephen will get called to write about a particular piece of architecture. Um, Adam gets called to photograph certain things. Like I, I remember going um, on a shoot with him to you know, the Whitney Museum. Um, and yeah, but Adam has been operating as a photographer uh, for you know, decades and decades they, to get to get to that point um, where the magazines are calling you and paying you um, to shoot for them. Yeah, yeah. Is, it's that that's a road. Um, you know, it's a usually, role. yeah. Like it, if I publish something in a magazine, um, it's it's often that you know, I am out there photographing and I'm trying to push it in front of somebody um, and sometimes it's successful, um, but I, yeah, I'm not always. Um, and it yeah. becomes very exhausting. <clears throat> the only time they use my photos is, what, is if I'm in a, a really remote setting where they don't, they can't send somebody to Burkina Faso to get a shot of something or don't have a local professional architecture photographer and sometimes they'll use mine as a last resort but um but you might also be thinking of the more uh, sort of uh, informal journal th things where I, I try to document the everyday life of the city or document projects informally and keep a journal that just allows me to sort of comment on on um you know the 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 quicker moving changes day to day of things like the pandemic or Black Lives Matter movement, um, and you know more and more have been trying to to do that in video form as well and keep a kind of running commentary that uh, hopefully like provides another level of um, um, sort of theorizing the present. Um, is what maybe part of it is striving to do, but I don't know if you have had a, any other specific question. I don't. I don't. I'm listening fairly passively. There, um, I, I think there's a, a, a lot of different ways to interpret the question and the role, and you know, there. But maybe just you know to have the understanding that um, you know there there are often separate things. The architectural photographer. Uh, the writer, um, it's, you know, it's rare that, you know, the projects that I'm showing you where I'm doing both roles, um, you know, I'm not showing you pristine architectural photographs. When, when mm -hmm. I go into an interior space to do something like that, you know, it's, um, like, like you're saying, Stephen, you can't manage both. Um, so it, the things that I'm doing, I'm choosing to do privately to advance my own work um, and and my own thinking and skills. But I think in, in professional terms, uh, those things are, are more often journalism and photography are, are separate. But you know, we could just be theorizing on something that isn't even what the, the question was getting at. Um, but maybe simply understanding uh, that there there are limits to to what one can do and and you yeah I, I do distinctly remember um, being being very shocked uh, on some of the early um, like interior architectural photo shoots that that I did as to how um, how exhausting they are how you can't pay attention to anything um, and, and and I'm sure it's it's of course the same thing when you're going to think about yeah, you know, using words to describe what you're seeing. Well, we, yeah, when you're on site, you know, doing doing reporting, the photographer is sort of you know really focused on, and it takes quite a lot of time to capture well framed, compelling images of a project. But then I've been on on reporting trips to like Beirut with photographers where they were doing doing that and. Um, and kept pulling me away from what I needed to be doing, which was like interviewing people and um, paying attention to a whole other set of, of questions.
questions like develop, developing sources for the reporting. It would be great. Actually, I was thinking Renan, our resident, uh, is also um, photographing and I've seen some of his work, so it would be great. Uh, I think Renan, if you'd like to continue the conversation uh, with Ashley and with Stephen afterwards, um, we, the residents will have the chance to continue with Ashley um, and discuss the works that they have uh, and the ideas that they have produced so far. Um, so at this point, perhaps it would be good, I think, to, um, to, to, to close off. Uh, if there are additional questions and there are a few still uh, open, um, it would be great maybe to try to answer them uh, in writing, if that's okay. Um, and uh, I would love maybe Ashley to, to see if, if you had a message for uh, the architects and students or young professionals interested in this uh, multidisciplinary approach um, today with all the complexities that are going on, uh, that would be great. I did. Um, yeah, thank you for prompting me on that. And it was, it, it was funny when I got your prompt yesterday, I had, um, I had just come back from, from a run and I often will run over the, um, the Manhattan Bridge and then the Brooklyn Bridge. And so you see all of this like infrastructure and, um, and I was thinking to myself and about you know, things coming together and, and the difficulty of, um, of that process, like especially you know, as a young architect, whether or not you're, you're making a, um, you're making a box, um, or you know whether or not you're making a bridge uh, or a photograph um, that you know the act of actually putting something together um, requires so much focus and concentration uh, that I think my advice is to uh, to build something to build something small and then to build something a little bit bigger um, and and to kind of practice you know, interacting with you know, materials, um, paper, wood, whatever, uh, because you learn, you learn a lot about um, yourself, I think, in doing something like that, uh, and, and about the process of, um, I guess it's almost like a certain awareness that one has to have um, of, of one's ability uh, in that act. And I don't think I said that as clearly as I would like. And, um, but I guess, you know, what, what I do think about, and this goes back to in terms of putting something together. When I worked in construction, um, it, you would inevitably see like certain craftsmen who would rush things, certain who would take their time. Um, and, and they could rarely ever have a dialogue between, like, between two two persons like that. Um, and I think in in that experience of of watching the more methodical person, uh, it taught me a lot of patience. And um, I think that's something that I apply to, I try to apply to, um, to most aspects of of my life. But uh, methodically put something together is my, is my advice. Or you know, move around, move around the city that you're in. So my reference to the bridges is that when I when I do that activity, um, not only do I see like these great feats of architecture and tectonics, but what's happening underneath my feet is, is constantly changing because the Manhattan Bridge is um, concrete and the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, you're often you're running on these wood planks, and um, and so that's uh, that has a change in experience. Um, based on how something is, is made. Yeah, that didn't come out as good as I, I wanted, but, you know, make something. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley.